Is economics a science, or is it a moral philosophy, or maybe it's a combination of the two? Kenneth Boulding, an economist who worked at George Mason University, referred to economics as a moral science. And Adam Smith was a moral philosopher. Prior to writing his book, The Wealth of Nations, Smith wrote another book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And people look at those as being dichotomous or actually opposites, but they're really not. What he was trying to show was how do we come together to cooperate in a moral manner in ways that promote the interests of everybody, which that's what he was really interested in, not just promoting the interests of, say, the king, but something for everybody. And so he wanted to understand how we come out, how we escape that poverty, poverty trap. And so he explained that in the two treaties, one really dealing with just the moral sentiments, things like justice, benevolence, and prudence, and then the other one, how we come together to cooperate. So his findings were really empirical, but they were also moral philosophy. But in the late 19th century and early 20th century, things started to change. Uh, the progressive movement was happening in the United States, and people like Robert Ely, who started the American Economic Association, they wanted to enhance the prestige of the economics profession, so they adopted more of the scientific methods of the hard sciences. And this actually continued on becoming even more intense during the latter half of the 20th century to the point where really the moral and philosophical aspects of economics have been disregarded. And that's missing something. It's missing a whole lot. As John Maurice Clark is known to have said, this is, it's attributed to him anyway, an irrational passion for dispassionate rationality will take all the joy out of life. And what he's saying here is if we're so focused on dispassionate things, human beings are passionate. We have feelings. We are not rocks. And when we do this, we, t we miss what it means to be human. And so as economists focus their efforts on this dispassionate rationality, we're missing the human side of life. So is economics a science or is it a moral philosophy? Or could it be a combination of both? Well, we could compare it to physics. And so let's do that. So let's see, in both we state a hypothesis or we have a theory. And now we want to prove it. Well, in physics, they can run controlled experiments. But in economics, we really can't. We can't have a control group. If we wanted to find out what the influence of adding more money to the economy uh, does, we don't have a group that we can set, set aside and say, okay, well, here's the control group. We're not going to raise money there. We're, gonna, we're not going to increase money supply there, but we're going to increase money supply in this group and find out what happens. Everything else constant. Well, there's no way to do that. And therefore, you don't really have the ability to run controlled experiments. We both gather data. His, economists use historical data. Test hypotheses. Both do that. And last thing is both generate predictive models. So there are a lot of scientific qualities to economic studies, but there are things that really are missing. The bigger thing is economics is a complicated system, is a complex system. Economics is a complex system where physics, again, physics can be complex as well. If you look at the universe, there are a lot of variables. There's no way to really uh, assess everything because there's so much. There are infinite value, a number of things that could happen. Well, economics is the same way, but physics really deals a lot with more of a complicated system, the thrust of a rocket, uh, gravity. These are things that have constant variables. They do not change. Economics has constantly changing variables. People's attitudes, people's tastes, their preferences, their abilities, uh, these things change quite a bit. The culture changes. And so it's hard to really assess things. But again, it's not impossible. Again, with, as I just talked about, Physics runs controlled experiments. Economists really can't. They have to use historical data. Historical data doesn't necessarily tell me what's going on in the future. It tells me what happened in the past, but it doesn't necessarily say I can predict now what's going to happen in the future. Positive versus normative analysis. A positive statement is something that is testable. A normative statement is an opinion. And when we think about economists, they like to consider themselves positive science scientists. They're removed from wanting to be have any influence whatsoever in the outcome, but that's really hard to do. When you're talking about human beings, uh, we're going to have some influence and some desire on the outcome, and therefore much of what we do, or a lot of what we do, has a lot of normative implications to this. And motivations and incentives are very important on this one, too. When I'm talking about the you know bowling ball falling from the top of a building, I really don't have any type of desired outcome. I just want to find the truth. Whereas, as an economist, when I'm dealing with human beings and human nature, I do have some preference for the outcome. And therefore, we always have to be concerned about the motivations and the incentives of studies or the authors of studies. And the last one, then, that leaves us with a lot of ambiguity. Any science is going to have ambiguity because we're dealing 
with variations of outcomes and therefore there can be some median or some average outcome but that doesn't necessarily mean that outcome is going to happen all the time there's a lot of variation for example if I brought in a hundred people who were all between the height of 5'7 and 5'9 and I randomly pick somebody I know that that person with a hundred percent certainty is going to be 5'8 give or take an inch but if I bring in a bunch of people who are between the between five feet and six foot five randomly distributed among those heights then if I pick somebody randomly it's not likely they're going to be five eight give or take an inch the average in that room will be about five eight but it doesn't mean that if I pick somebody randomly there's a lot of ambiguity because there's a lot greater variation and so economics has a lot of variation which makes it more difficult to predict unlike say physics that means yes economics is a science but it has limitations more limitations say the hard science like a meteorologist forecasting weather they're dealing with complex systems too and therefore it limits their predictability if I'm looking if a meteorologist tells me it's gonna snow six months from today I won't even pay attention to it there's no way they can know that therefore they're good in the short run but not necessarily the long run economics has somewhat the same problem it's not to say all studies are only short term but the economist did do a study uh, a few years ago and what they looked at was they took thousands of economic predictions the economists who predicted them and they found that beyond a few months those predictions are basically worthless and therefore we deal with some short-term things when we start making these predictions economics has a lot to do with moral philosophy has a lot to do with how we come together and think and structure a structured way of thinking of how we can act but it's much more difficult to make these predictions but it's not impossible again we look at economics now some of the problems with the individual studies first thing is we have confirmation bias I have an idea or I have a belief and so I go out and get the data and I uh, do a study that's going to confirm my bias second is we have observation bias this simply means we get data that's available but it doesn't mean we get all data for example we know that culture has a lot to do with outcomes and yet there's no way to assess culture and there's no way to assess certain institutional structures and yet we're ignoring those because we don't have that data so there's a lot of observation bias we're dealing with human subjects and this is a real important thing our behavior changes therefore any study that's done is bound to change because human behavior changes our tastes change our talents change our desires change our culture changes and therefore value judgments are going to be inevitable and we're also dealing with researchers who stand to gain or lose based on the outcome of their studies. This is one example we can see is uh, Frederick Michigan, an economist who was paid $100,000, actually more than that possibly, to write a paper about the banking situation in Iceland where he talked about how great and robust it was after the Iceland economy collapsed and the banking system collapsed due to the financial crisis he changed the title to the problems going on in the Iceland banking system uh, we see this with studies on global warming a lot of the scientists who are coming out with global warming studies uh, are being paid to come out with those specific outcomes now it's not to say we disregard them what this is saying is let's be careful when we look at these studies to make sure we're getting the absolute truth or we're getting something that's more unbiased because there's a lot of bias within some of these studies so is economics a moral philosophy well it is indeed a science and there's a lot of scientific methods to it but we're also dealing with policy and moral and ethical issues and therefore it's hard to separate yourself from these and say well I'm completely dispassionate and not at all influenced by these moral issues these ethical issues or policy right for example should we use wealth creation should that be something that transcends all other objectives what about liberty should that be something we should be concerned with well economists want to say they don't care about they're not they don't care but they're not going to influence that but those are very important attributes of our human society how should wealth be distributed that's a very important argument Economists will say, well, here are the studies that show how wealth is distributed, but I'm not going to make a statement about how it should be. But we should be looking at some of these. How do price controls affect things? So although 20th century economists and the rise of scientism sought to disavow the subject as moral philosophy, its foundation is moral philosophy. It is moral philosophy, and you can't necessarily divorce economics from that. So the takeaway, yes, economists use a scientific method to better understand our world. However, given the complexity of the system, it's really difficult to 
distance the to make any accurate predictions and to try to distance from that moral philosophy we can move beyond reason and anecdotal observations in other words it's just not my observation we can gather data and assess it but we have to be careful because we're prone to confirmation and observational bias and finally economists do have a lot to contribute beyond the seemingly positive scientific methods with some of the moral arguments and we can argue in these moral judgments just like any other thing we argue and I think it's very important that when we start talking about economics we understand the limitations and the foundation